Hello, welcome uh, to Elf Anywhere Demo Q&A. My name is Sarah Mitchell. I am the Director of Customer Success, and I'm joined by Dion McCormick, who will be doing a presentation today on offline, uh, if I remember correctly. Uh, Dave is not here. Dave had um, uh, some stuff he needed to take care of in his uh, at home, so he's not going to be able to join us today, but he might join later. I don't know. We'll see. So you're you're stuck with me and Dion today. So Dion, are you there? <laughs> yes, I am. Thank you right. very much. <laughs> I'm going to make you the presenter. Thank you. There and you go. And we can go. see your screen. So yeah, take it away. Oh, awesome. Thank you so much, Sarah. It's always a pleasure, a pleasure. Uh, Paul, my voice may be a little crackly, just getting over a little cold. I think something's been going around. It's not COVID, but something else has been going around. So if I get crackly or I have to go off and cough, uh, you'll be aware of that there. But thank you so much for joining us. We really enjoy having you with us. Uh, obviously, this is about you. And so what's important for us is help us help you by two ways. One is that if you have questions, we're here to try and answer any and all the questions. If not, we do our best to follow up and make it happen. Uh, if you do, go to the go to webinar control panel and go to the questions area and enter there. Sarah will be so kindly reviewing that and uh, you know watching those and bringing them up as we go through the process. Either questions on our con uh, topic for today or questions regarding other things that you may have an interest with. And again, we try to do our best there. Also, Sarah will doing, be doing a fabulous job of correcting all of my errors uh, real time, which is always a very valuable thing. And I do appreciate her efforts on that part because I tend to make a lot of them. Um, that, and also remember, if you have topics you're interested in, make sure to send emails to guides at alphasoftware.com because that's our source for putting together kind of the topics that we use for our webinars and other pieces there. So I just wanted to say, make sure it helps us because it allows us to kind of do some homework, prepare, uh, lower my number of error rates because I've got a little preparation to it uh, on those kind of things. And we love to see your questions because it really tells us what people are interested in and how we can best serve the alpha community. So uh, I'm gonna be going over a, uh, basically talking about offline applications. And Actually, there's some existing capabilities. I kind of want to cover those, but also a new capability we're going to discuss. Won't demo today, but uh, we're going to be doing that very, very soon. And also answering any questions you may have around offline capabilities. And we're going to talk a bit about the different offline environments, tools, et cetera, that are available to you. Okay. So uh, the other thing I wanted to announce, let's go ahead and go all the way over here, is that we have a new production release so it was just released uh it is out on the 20 well 24th of march so it's a couple days there but uh, relatively new there uh and if you go to and i'm going to go ahead and grab the release notes here and put them into the chat window in case you want to go in oh wait sarah already have it in my chat window you're way ahead of me um there's some really fun stuff, and I, I'm not going to go into details on these today, but they are. we're going to be covering them again next month, a few little topics there, because I think they're very fascinating. Um, there's a number of really nice little small user interface enhancements that really make your user interface pop, make it easier for your users, but there's some really interesting ones that I think uh, I really wanted to highlight myself. One was connection strings to Google Drive and Dropbox. Obviously, we've had connection strings to Azure and S3 for some, some time. And we've now enhanced that and really locked it down in this release. I personally use Dropbox. That's my primary tool that I do from my, and Dropbox has a lot of really cool features and capabilities. And more and more co uh, companies in the world are using Dropbox or Google Drive to store their assets. And, you know, they want to be able to interface with Alpha, uploading, downloading, listing, et cetera, in their solutions. So this opens up a whole new set of sort of ways you can store that file information on a cloud-based service in a secure fashion and using the current techniques there. So those are very interesting. We are going to cover those in a little more depth and do a little demonstration, et cetera, on a very near future presentation. But I wanted to highlight that because, again, something that I've heard many times people would like that capability. Uh, you know, Dropbox has a lot of really cool things. Like, for instance, you can send requests and other stuff to get files. You can put, you know, and so therefore, once that comes in, you can be monitoring that Dropbox location, seeing what's going on. So really cool stuff there. And the other, which is significant, uh, and I won't be covering today, uh, this is a much more in-depth, but there's the Xcode CLI tools to automate your apps when you're doing mobile apps. 
that has a huge impact on productivity of the uh, developers who are using Alpha to do mobile apps. It's a very in-depth, but there's a great video that walks you through it. It really simplifies the process for creating your iOS versions of your apps. And so for folks that are doing a lot of development on uh, the iOS platform using Alpha, that's a really big winner from that standpoint. And then another one I wanted to mention that we are going to touch on today. Where is it? Where is it? It's actually down. It's not on that. It's uh, a little bit farther down, but it's called indexed DB. Uh, so we'll talk about that a little bit later. So those are some major items in there. There's also a lot of nice little new ones that are available. Check them out as uh, uh, Sarah's already done as she's put the link to that in the uh chat window and so check that out and enjoy it so with that i'm going to pop off and pop over back to my presentation here jump down let's go all the way down to my files here right there okay so today what we're going to focus on is sort of a, a 101 on uh uh, offline options. So, kind of, there's a new one that's come available in the May, in the new release that I want to touch on and uh, discuss what here. But I want to kind of go through the different ways you can manage offline information, and this is really important. Um, you know, in terms of because of the mobility and because more and more people are doing work out of the office that offline capabilities. And there's really kind of two different schools of thought on that. Obviously, more and more people are going to the web browser as their primary delivery tool for applications, which puts Alpha anywhere in a great position. Problem with the web browser, it really wasn't a great offline tool. So your traditional path was, well, I need to go and build a mobile app and do everything there. Uh, and that's how I go. And in fact, Alpha recognized that early on and built in a lot of capabilities to make that process easy. But what we've seen over the last few years is that more and more people would rather deploy apps through the web browser, not go through the whole um, sort of process of developing custom apps or uh, native apps uh, because they didn't need the full service. They just needed people to be able to have some data offline, be able to work offline and reconnect and connect that data in. Now, if you are looking at specific features you need from the phone, uh, you know, lower level capabilities, then there's just no way around it. You're going to have to do a node, uh, sort of a native application using the toolkits. But I want to talk about the different ways that you can approach this uh, to make your life easy and achieve it. And you kind of pick the level that you're interested in. Specifically, you know, you kind of know what your business users need and require, so you can align your requirements and what you're going to develop to that from that standpoint there. So your offline options are in your desktop or mobile web browser. So that's your first one there. Uh, the beauty of that is the fact that, you know, basically you, you publish it to your alpha server and especially alpha cloud and you're done. You know, you don't have to worry about that. Uh, the cons are, and I'll mention this in a few min uh, minutes that it's not as bad anymore, but there were limitations that, you know, because of security elements, there were a lot of limitations that were play, uh, placed around the ability to manage data in your web browser. Uh, stability and other things like was the data persistent or did it, you know, once you close the browser window, was it gone? So therefore you're not really offline because that's not a good thing. There were also significant limitations in terms of how much space you were able to take to be able to store data offline and, you know, limited access to mobile hardware, meaning you didn't get all the other nice mobile capabilities from there. But again, this part is super important. People want to move quickly. They want to develop. They want to get out there. They want to make changes. They don't want to have to go through build cycles and deployment cycles and other things like that. Uh, so this is really a nice way to go, especially if you're just looking at making sure you can do some data management offline with your applications. And again, we got a new feature we'll talk about in a few moments that's really helpful on that. Now, Alpha Launch is another great one. Uh, you know, it's very easy to deploy. Alpha Launch is basically a pre-made Alpha application considered a shell that's available from Alpha. There's no charge for it per se. You know, you still need the server, et cetera. And what this allows you to do is basically within that shell, deploy from your app server a application that you could run. And since that shell was native, it actually acts, uh, gave you access to hardware. Uh, it does require the Alpha Launch app and deploying those pieces there. It's got limited branding, although there are programs that are available to allow you to um, brand that. 
uh, and there are limited plugins. But it's a really nice factor if you have to do a lot more offline data management. It's a really nice thing, and it's actually a nice interface. You can put together some very sophisticated kind of capabilities, get access to more hardware from there. And again, you get rid of that one of that key things, which is the offline data side size limitations. Um, there aren't those there because the shell can use the native file system to store the data that you need for your application. And that can be a lot of data, both images, et cetera, from that standpoint there. Now, your other option is, uh, it's called PhoneGap, but really it's uh, it's not PhoneGap anymore. That's a little dated there. I didn't want to make, put that in there. Get rid of that. So uh, this is where you're going to build a native app. And as I mentioned, we're continuing to make that an easy process with the Xcode command line interface tools, et cetera. So the really benefit is you kind of have full boat. You have full access to the hardware. You can completely brand it any way you want. You can give uh, App Store access where people can download it through the App Store. You can get a whole native feel on any app, whichever platform you target, using these capabilities. Uh, obviously, it's a build process and a release process, so it's not as fast and effective as just posting something to your server. Again, that's kind of the nice thing about the Alpha launch is that middle ground is that it has the ability, sorry there, uh, has the ability, which is really powerful, to be able to dynamically update your apps out in the field. So that's kind of one of the nice things that Alpha Launch will do for you. Uh, there are extra costs because you have to, it's not a lot, but you have to be, you know, part of the, uh, uh, like for instance, Apple, you have to pay for their develop license and other pieces. And there's a complexity issue. There's more of a process versus just hitting publish. So those are your key offline options that are available for. Now, once you've kind of understood which option, you can kind of pick and choose there. I'm going to go ahead and jump. I want to go back to this issue right here because I think it's one of the coolest new features that built into it. So let's go down to it. Uh, there is a new offline option called Index DB. And this is a relatively new feature of browsers, of modern browsers. And again, you got to be careful that not all browsers support this. Some of the older browsers, some browsers that people may be fixed because they're in enterprises may do it. But it is essentially a key value pair database that is available in the browser for applications to use. The benefits of this cool technology is that it gives you a much larger uh, storage space. Before you were limited to five, 25 megs. I mean, it was a very limited amount of space, but now you have a much broader and larger amount of data you can manage in your application on the local device. And we have full support in our UX component, meaning that we've done all the hard work to make it easy for you to be able to use that database with your components and handle that process from there. Another item too is it's more persistent. Um, if you shut down your browser and bring it back up, it doesn't delete all that, whereas some others do. So, you know, that you, your dependency level is much better in this scenario because it's a much more persistent data store that's available for the uh, user developed there. Now, what I want to do is go back and talk a little bit. I wanted to bring that up because I think it's the most interesting aspect. And actually, if you go to, if you're interested, just if you go here and scoot down on those release notes we sent out, there is a section on it that is available. Let me go keep going down. I should know a little bit there. Pass these other really cool things. Come on. Security framework. Come on. Okay. It's under here. If you look for indexed space DB, here are the new capabilities and commands that are available for it. It has a little information on it from there. Um, things like you can check before you use it, is it available, et cetera. So it has a broad left, uh, and we're going to cover these in more details uh, to do that. But the neat thing about this is, again, you now have another option on your offline capability through the web browser to be able to store more data, more persistent data, so you aren't driven to having to use another method to support your users. They can be doing offline stuff in the browser and have a much better experience from that standpoint there. Let me go there, let me go, okay. So back to this here, um, I wanted to then cover uh, the two other primary ways to uh, handle offline data. So the first one is called the client-side data cache, and that's been in there for some time. This is a neat tool that allows you, and I'm gonna show you where to get to it in the actual system, but this is a tool that allows you, which kind of like IndexedDB, but again, was limited in terms of how much space you would get. But 
this was a really nice way to be able to download a bunch of data in your application uh, and handle it in there. And Alpha takes care of downloading that data for you so you don't have to worry about that. So uh, that was a really nice feature that's available. I think people will move towards IndexedDB because it's more of a, a more robust version of this capability, but this still exists and is fully supported. The other is called local storage. Now, local storage has been part of the web browser landscape for many, many years. Uh, again, this is fully managed your score uh, by your code. It is basically a scratch pad local storage that's in the browser, but the concern was persistence on this. You didn't get the persistence you did on these other methodologies. So for instance, if they restarted their browser, you may wipe out everything in local storage and have to re-download it if necessary. If you had any changes, you'd be not in great shape. So those were some of the deficiencies. It was still nice for little small pieces and you could use that, but when it came to more significant uh, capabilities, we'll go from there. Okay, actually I should turn off my focus. Okay, cool. Um, now, so your primary tools for offline were especially if we're just talking about the web browser, were local storage, the uh, client-side data cache, and the index DB. Now, the reality is there were other options that took care of stuff for you. So let's take an example. So this is, uh, let's go look at the different uh, controls that are available for you. And I wanna talk about the list control because the list control is really your primary tool for offline. So really most of your stuff will be done through the list control and it's all built in. It's really handy, it connects, it syncs, it manages data, all those pieces there. These other techniques is that if you want to expand and do more, say, call them more advanced techniques, you're able to do that. Huh. I guess that is, oh, I'm, she, that's my wife, by the way, so that's probably why um, it's saying okay. Okay, so what I want to do is walk through first the list control and talk a bit about how it manages offline data. And then I want to go through client side data cache, local storage, and then uh, briefly touch on the index DB. By the way, there was another method um, called SQL database. It's really oriented around your mobile. So if you're building a full app, you could create an uh, a SQLite database and access it from there. But I think these other techniques are kind of moving ahead on that and really taking over those capabilities from here. So what, again, I want to focus on is the core fundamental tools that are in the development environment for you to be able to manage offline data. Okay, so we'll go in here, and I've got a sample program, and I just want to go ahead and set up a UX. Bear with me. And again, if you have questions and stuff, go ahead and make sure to put them into there. We'll go through those pieces here. Okay. Now I'm gonna go ahead and quickly, and I like to do this in front of you, is so I'm gonna create a connection string, and I'm gonna go ahead and create a demo connection string. I'll use SQLite for this. Okay, so I have a connection string in there. Good, just so we can do that from there. So in the UX, and we're gonna talk about it, we're gonna focus on the UX component because that is really the home for all of your different offline capabilities. First and foremost is the list control. So the list control, and I'm sure everybody has experience on it, um, is a powerful, powerful tool to handle all your offline capabilities. And it's your really step one tool to do offline because it's all built in. Basically, the list control takes care of all the plumbing, all the management for you so you don't have to worry about it. So the classic situation is I have some data on my database I wanna be able to uh, synchronize that data and have it local on my local system there. So I'm going to connect to my backend database. I'm going to select a table. We'll go ahead and just do customers. Select a fields. Okay. I can do filtering, etc. I'm going to enable a detail view so I'm able to edit that data. By the way, when you enable a detail view, it enables a whole bunch of basically um, underlying capabilities to then manage that data locally, trapping changes, handling synchronizations, other pieces like that. <coughs> Excuse me. Oh, my mic won't. Everything's blowing apart today. And then also I want to make sure that I have disconnected operation. So the bulk of your applications are going to be, hey, I'm reading database, I'm providing it to my people out in the field, and then they're going to be able to use that information here. So I click it, it's gonna create my list 
it's going to also create all my controls for me and the buttons that are necessary to manage that data within it. So done. That is the essence of creating an initial offline application. Uh, again, this is the quick start. Now I can go in and make a bunch of changes. I can add an enormous amount of sort of call it fine tuning on your application so you can do things offline. Now remember, the only thing I'm going to bring up as a caveat is that uh, we, the list control uses local storage and other stuff as the sort of the saving of the information. So if you do refresh your browser, uh, if you're not on a mobile platform wrapped in, in a, a list or wrapped in a, you know, a shell like Alpha Launch or other pieces, then you are, you know, you have some potential. And it's kind of, it's interesting. I found in all my testing history, it's like, sometimes it's very persistent. I'll close my browser, bring it back up, bring up a list and it has all my changes there. But other situations may flush what's there. And so it's just, you just got to be aware of that. It's not a negative. It's just the way that the operation works. Uh, and I'm checking with the team and I'm not sure, and Sarah, I'll have to put a pin in this, is if they're planning to offer, um, you know, the index DB is an option for storing data so you get a little more persistence. So the least list, uh, mach uh, the list control can use that. And I apologize. I, I'm going to follow up with Sari on that. I don't have the answer on that today, but it's kind of a curious element because then you get the best of both worlds. You're building list controls that can use index DB as that. Now, again, so, as I mentioned oh, I'm just before, going to interrupt oh, you right now. Yes, that, yes, that's that's in the new release. That that was the thing that was added is index DB as the list. Uh, persistent storage. Boom. Day. Okay. Thank you. And yep. I apologize. I should have yep. read on that and known that well, before. We just that's, had the release. So, <laughs> yeah. So that's huge. I mean, that's enormous. That means that your list control can now do more because it's going to be able to have a more persistent local data storage. Uh, again, the one thing that will be important, and I'm sure the list control checks, is it says, well, do you have a browser that supports index DB? Because not every, most modern ones do but not all do. If they're on IE, an old IE one, there may be an issue there, but it will give you warnings and handle that stuff for you. So that's very exciting because what the list control will do is based on my query, it's going to call the database, grab a bunch of data and bring it down and store it locally before on local storage, et cetera, but now in index DB. And the cool thing about that is that can be a much larger size of data. So you can bring down a lot more information and make it more persistent in the browser. So uh, again, you're always at risk, like if they flush their browser and do other things like that, there's nothing we can do about that. But this is a really big step forward, wherein before people would go, oh, I wanna keep that much data offline, you go, ooh, yeah, that's probably gonna be a little challenging because there's certain limitations. Those limitations are, so now you're not forced to go a different direction, you can go ahead and use it from there. So thank you so much, Sarah for clarifying that for me, that's super important there. So your first and foremost tool is the list control and it handles everything for you. When it connects, it goes, gets the data, brings it local, does all the synchronization for you, it will help you do error checking in terms of making sure things are in sync and it'll even update and write the information back to the database in the back end, uh, which is super duper healthy from there. Now, the other area you wanna do is you can also use another method. So let's say, before what would happen in just a little bit of history is that I would have my list, my primary list with my database information, but then there was some other data that I wanted local on it. So let's let's just use an engineering example. Let's say we had a rate table or like an insurance, or we had a table of data that I wanted to have locally that I could do client side calculations and other things like that. Well, historically, and this was a while back, you would create a different list and then sync that data down. Well, it's kind of overkill because all I really wanted to do was get a set of data down that I had locally available for my um, my analysis when I'm on the local device. So it turned out that people would put a bunch of different lists on there and obviously more list is more data. You know, it's just heavier weight than you need it. So the team introduced the concept of the idea of client side data cache editor. And the idea here is that instead of you creating lists, what it's going to allow you to do is go in here. You can then add one or more data caches, basically local store of data that Alpha will take care of. And this is really cool. When it launches the UX, it's going to go up and bring this data down for you. So you don't have to write a lot of code. It's very similar to the list in terms of I'll go add item and I'll call this my test. And then if I go in there, I can now pull down 
something from a SQL query. I could even bring down nested SQL data. I could just have a set of static data I have there. Or very cool is I could run a XBasic command that would then generate the data and bring it down. So any of these are value. And you know, so SQL query is great. Much like a list, you select it. Let's say I wanted another list of say, that's more information. Um, like I wanted to have a local list of shippers here, but I'm not gonna manage that shipper data. All I wanna do is have that shipper data available for other things on my control. So once I've gone and done this, um, it will, oh, oh, I have to go and put in the columns. And all I really wanted was the ID and the company. That's all I wanted locally there. Uh, so now that I have this data there uh, and click okay, now I have my client side data cache. I don't have a big list on there. You see, I don't even have a control on there. But now when this runs, Alpha is going to take that information and bring it down locally to my UX when it's running. And then I can refer to that data in my you know, scripts and other things like that to be able to do work from there. It's really handy. And it actually had a dramatic impact on simplifying um, the structure of a lot of UXs. People ended up having a bunch of static data they wanted available and they wanted it dynamic, meaning that they wanted it up on the server and every once in a while get updated. And before they were using lists and it just became cumbersome, this went a long way towards handling it from there. So now I have my ability to manage my data and now with IndexedDB, it's completely uh, more powerful from that standpoint. <coughs> Excuse me. The other aspect, we have our client side data cache, which allows you to bring down these static data. But I also wanted to mention, like you could also do things called local storage. So this is really now diving into like code oriented stuff. So most of the time you never really need it, but sometimes people wanna do and store data locally in the browser while they're doing some work, like maybe interim calculation values or some other things along those lines. Um, so I'm going to jump into JavaScript functions because I really just want to go over here to our online documentation. And, uh, okay, there we go. Let's see. Storage, I think it's in here. Oh, you know, it's, I think it's in, um, see those are stayed. It's basically, actually, let me bear with me. That is pure JavaScript. So JavaScript, so... That's why we don't spend a whole lot of time on it because the reality is it's very JavaScript there. Okay. Local, local storage. But I just want to point to it. It's been a, just a few moments here. By the way, W3 School is a good place. If you ever have any kind of things there. But it's barely a JavaScript thing where you can basically just say local storage set an item and its key value. What is the item name or key? and the value, and then when I want to get that, I do uh, essentially a local storage get item. So that's handy. Again, for a little short-term kind of stuff, you can just add it to a script, uh, have that there, and then it stays in that browser. Again, I can't guarantee how long it will be there, but then it's kind of like a local state information that's available. Local storage is very limited. It's not meant for a lot of data. It's more meant for a little few things there, just to kind of help your program out there. But just know that that's available. That is like, hey, if I just need to sort like a scratch pad kind of thing, this is available from there. Um, index DB is far more severe. And I'm going to go into this more uh, in the future. Today, I'm not going to spend much time on it other than introducing the concept. But it is a now standard. And this is Microsoft's there from there. Uh, while web storage is for small, it's left large amounts of structured data. Index DB provides that solution. Now the key concept here is that it's basically, it, this has all the information. In fact, let me go ahead and grab this real quick. And I'm gonna put that on the chat window in case people wanna just do a little reasoning on there. Oh, and thanks for adding the SQLite database uh, capability. Really cool, SQLite's really neat and, and you can store a lot of data on there, but again, it's for specific environments there. So this talks about these pieces here. So just, uh, you know, this is the step up from there. Now, the cool thing about it is you don't have to, when you go through this, bear with it. You don't need to know all this stuff, you know, because Alpha has done all the work for you in terms of making life easy. For instance, you don't have to worry about it when you're doing a list control because we use that capability built in there. But we also have a whole series of new functions that are available that will allow you to then 
um, access information from there. And I'm just going to cover them for a few moments here just to give you a feel. So for instance, you can find out if the database is available. You can also set item, delete item, get link, get keys, etc. So these are kind of nice little programmatic things. If you want to directly interface with the index DB, you can do that within this situation here. And again, more documentation. And we're going to go through a more involved uh, conversation on this in the near future. But I wanted to introduce this and let you know how exciting it is because it really opens up a whole new set of applications that we really were able to tack when you're using a pure web browser solution than you have now. So let me go back to my thing there. So again, we have the new index DB that is available. You can use any mix of these different ones. So the cool thing is thinking that it has a whole series of, uh, series of toolkits and you can pick the tool that's gonna be the most appropriate thing for your item. Some are easier in terms of there's less you know, coding, some are more code intensive, but as we continue to embrace IndexedDB, I anticipate seeing a lot of other really cool features coming down the road in terms of the user interface being able to handle it, um, having more of that data in that IndexedDB uh, and not having to go to the server for things. So I'm super excited about that. And we're gonna learn more about that in a few months to come, but we'll dive into that in more detail from there. So super important, uh, Alpha has significant offline capabilities. There are different levels of say complexity and sophistication. Uh, we support different app platforms, you know, just desktop, mobile web browser, Alpha Launch and the mobile app. It's kind of cool. That's the new, I guess, way to spell it from there. So awesome. And uh, so I'd like to go ahead, uh, Sarah, at this point, kind of open it up again. Idea was kind of give you a landscape there and we can answer any kind of questions about that landscape. And again, if there are any on this, we can talk about other pieces from there. So. All right. Well, I'm going to give everyone a minute to type in your questions, uh, questions about today or uh, something else that you might have on your mind. Um, thank you for the presentation so far. It's been good. Uh, yeah. Here's one. Is client side data cache available in the Alpha Anywhere Community Edition? I believe it uh, is, but uh, yes. I would have to check that. It is. Yeah. Yeah, it is. It is available. Yes, the, for those of you who have Community Edition, the only limitations in there is you can't create DBF tables, you can't build desktop applications, and you can only publish to uh, Alpha Cloud. Uh, everything else is available. Um, could you show, uh, Dion, could you show again how to get to the menu that lists the client-side data cache in Alpha Anywhere? Oops, my mic went off for a second. Did Was there a question or are we waiting for the next one? No, oh, I have a question. <laughs> Someone wants to hey, see yeah. where where is the client side data cache menu? How did you find that? Can you show that oh, again? Oh, good point. And I apologize if I went that too quickly. Is that um, when you're in your UX here, there is a menu up here at top, and there's a lot of really cool stuff buried in here. Um, and if you go down to client side data cache editor, be careful. Data series is different. We want to talk about client side. They operate, op, op, wait. they operate very similar, but this is the client. So you would go to client side data cache editor, uh, select that from the menu. And then in here, then you could add your client side data caches and you can have more than one. You're not limited to one within the system there. So that's uh, the pieces here. You can also uh, add some other nice things like you can show progress. So if it's a fair amount of data, you can give the person a heads up there. Uh, and you can also trigger events and other things like that. So again, go to the menu here, client side data, and then pull from there. One other thing I do wanna show, and this is kind of a poor man's version of data series. The data series actually, has a cool offline capability, which I don't spend much time on, but is really handy, especially when you're talking about charting, et cetera. So we talked about data series has been in there for a long, long time. It's a very traditional kind of feature. And what a data series is very similar in terms of I'm connecting to a backend data source, and I'm kind of going through this here, uh, and here are my different data sources. Now, originally data series were online only. That was the trick, and that was important to understand. That's why they kind of introduced the client side um, um, data cache because it was really meant for offline capability. 
But uh, one of the cool things that are now available is I can essentially use the data series and there's a new feature here called Publish Data Series Data to Client Side. And so what it will do is it'll run and you can click on that and this data series is now available client side. Now, a couple things that are different between the two of them. First and foremost, the data series is not as flexible and programmable as the client side data cache because the client side data cache was built from day one to handle complex kind of offline capabilities. Data series was in there. This was added to say, well, if you want to pull this down, go ahead and do that. So just you can play with both. They're both available. One thing that's cool about data series is that certain controls can use data series as a, as a, a source of information. So there's some cool kind of neat things I've found over the days that you can do those kind of pieces there. But I would say if you're starting from scratch, really do focus on the client side data cache editor because that's going to give you the most modern, most clear, you know, access to these tools there. Uh, and again, as I mentioned, this index DB is a game changer. It's really important. And we already have functions in there, but we're going to probably see a lot more cool uh, capabilities come along as the team. They basically put in all the plumbing. Now that we have the plumbing in the alpha solution and all those and kind of checked out and working great, now they can layer on top of that a lot of really fun, cool stuff. And I know they have a lot of tricks up their sleeve. They're planning to uh, spring on us in the near future. Thank you. Cool. Good question. Thank you. Yeah. Good for going, going over that again. Um, and then um, let's see if there's, I guess I saw another one on data cache. Oh, no. Here's one on offline storage. Uh, does the view box support the same offline storage features as the list? Uh, and, it does well let me go ahead and show you a view box here so i'll just go ahead and stick in a view box here very important is that uh the first right out of the gate the view box is really a display technology the list control is both display edit and sync so if you're going to do any kind of offline editing you really go to it is the list but one of the coolest thing about this is that the view box can actually use the list control as its data source which is really powerful but let me go ahead and add a view box real quick and let me go ahead and show you the data sources just so you're aware of what data source is here. So we'll go here. Then I can go into test, uh, go to my data source. I'm going to say it is HTML just means it's an HTML box, but then data here. So I went to the data source, view box type, and made it data. Now we can go in here and we can say, where do we get that data? As you can see, you can get database query. You can get a REST API, static JSON, a JavaScript function. Now, what's kind of cool is that right away, if I already have a list on there, I can then use the view box as a really nice way to present data in the list control. And it will be, it will take care of synchronizing it and taking care of that from the standpoint of if you click a row on the list is going to show in the view box and it makes it, you can really create very nice presentation because the view box is essentially HTML and CSS and more and more people can just drop pre-made bootstrap things and other things in there and make them look fabulous from that standpoint. But I do want to highlight real quick JavaScript function. JavaScript function means I can write a little function and guess what? There are a lot of functions built into our JavaScript library for interacting with client-side data cache. So if you're a little bit more sophisticated, you could actually use the client-side data cache and wire it up to a view box there. Now, again, when you're talking about doing editing, not you really want to stay away from that. You really just want to use the list control. It does everything for you, handles it. That's really good there. But if you're a little bit more adventuresome, you can look at using, say, a client-side data cache and a JavaScript function to do it from there. Now, I can anticipate down the road, maybe this will be indexed DB. Who knows? So we'll see as they explore and expand the technology from there. Uh, a couple of things that are nice is the REST API. So if you just want to pull an API and show it on the screen in a nice way, it's easy to do it that way. Custom is where you can actually even have like a X space function on your server that you can call to grab that data and present it on the user interface for the person. Thank so you. I'm not sure if I fully answered that question, but. Yeah, no, I, I think you did. The, you, you pointed out very um, correctly, the view box really is more of a, of a, uh, a viewing viewing your data and doesn't have all yeah. those built-in CRUD operations like the list does. Yeah. It's really a presentation layer is kind of really what it is. And it's wonderful that, I mean, I have more and more people 
who were using list controls to display data, but list controls can be a little heavier. View boxes are insanely fast. Once you have them up there, they render just, just instantaneously on the screen. So definitely explore view boxes because they're really powerful because they really make your app lightweight, it loads faster. It, and then also the cool thing I like, and you can do a lot of this in the list control because the list control handles it, but you can drop in third party CSS and uh, other pieces in there and make your stuff look just absolutely fantastic uh, right out of the gate. It's And you can hire a third party designer to actually say, hey, do a layout of this like little control panel. They can do it, hand it to you, drop it in here, you map in the fields into that and you're good to go. Yes, and then for those of you wanting more information, I have dropped two links in the chat for you. One is just on view boxes in general and one about populating a view box from a REST API. Uh, and yeah, if you go back really to our, if you go up on YouTube, we've done a lot of presentations over the last couple of years with view boxes. So definitely go check out our YouTube playlist. Uh, back off, I'll go find that link for you. Um, uh, but before I do that, Dion, since you mentioned it, and since I said uh -huh. it, was uh -oh. at least someone I wants to see, it. someone wants to see how you set the list to store its data in IndexedDB. Actually. I might have to turn that over to you because this is not the latest <laughs> release right here. I, oh, you're not today running I the latest release. Oh, release. oh, I, oh, I so see how bad. it is. Oh. <laughs> this is going to come out and basically what's going to happen is we're going to take this out afterwards and then she's going to do the demo and then I'm going to voice over it. So it looks like, oh, yes. Uh, <laughs> It'll be the best demo ever. <laughs> I am so sorry. I mean, it tells you. No like, worries. Uh, no worries. Yeah. So uh, uh, let me see. Um... <laughs> I'll pause my sharing. <laughs> <laughs> Aha. Looks like some... Some folks appreciate that. Um, <laughs> um, I'm being honest. Please hold on. Like to... They know when I'm, <laughs> they know when I'm lying. <laughs> uh, let's see. I, oh, okay. There we go. Okay, I'm going to stop sharing. No, you made me stop already. Uh, I'm on it. Mm -hmm. Real important. Uh, there we go. That, Can you see yeah, IndexedDB. Yep, it's coming up. Real quick, IndexedDB is not a full SQL database, so don't think you're getting a local. It's a key value pair, so it's oriented around JSON uh, and that kind of data. But the cool thing is alpha is very, under the covers, we use that a lot. So it matched really internally from there. But just a heads up, you're not going to be running site SQL queries unless there's some technology I'm not aware against your local um, IndexedDB. It'll be more of a key value pair stuff. So I'll shut up. Yeah, there there is a link too in the chat. I posted a bit earlier. Um, it links to our index DB documentation for the UX component methods. And there is a discussion in there about what index DB is. And I do we do link to a few resources um, that you may be interested in. It's it's a bit different than a SQL database, uh, but it's yeah. It's, uh, and to be honest, that's where the industry is going. I mean, SQL will be around forever, but more and more modern applications are using kind of what are called yeah. NoSQL databases like Mongo and Couch, and this is a form of that. Uh, yes. Yeah, you know, it's. I can't wait. And they've always tried it, but someone just needs to write a uh, like a SQL. I know they're trying to it, but like if I could just take a pure SQL call and make it against a, uh, a NoSQL database, I would be happy, happy, happy. But <laughs> alas. Alas, the I think that's a opposite of NoSQL, though. <laughs> I know it is. Well, it's like I want NoSQL SQL. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, since I've been able to take over presentation here, I did want to mention next month, guys. We've already planned out our, our webinars, and there is inter interest in it. And I just want to let you know what's coming up here uh, next week, April sixth. Uh, we are doing a new feature review. So. Any of the features that you see in the night, in the night, nightly build, in the release notes, uh, any of those new things, or even some that may have you know, come in a previous uh, build, build eight thousand, I think was the one right before we, the one we just released. That's correct. Uh, I've been using eight thousand for a while. Those? That was a good build. Go ahead, yeah. <laughs> Go ahead and send us those questions yeah. about those features you might be interested in. Um, it's not going to take us very long to just go through a review of what's in the in the new release. So if there's some some specific feature that you want to know a little bit more about um, that isn't already scheduled for the 20th or 27th of April, because we're going to be doing a deep dive on index DB with lists and client side data cache, as well as looking at the new storage connections for Dropbox and Google yeah. Drive, yeah. Uh, get those into us before next week. And we will be happy to address it as part of the presentation. And then on the 13th, we're sneaking in another uh, mobile development webinar on image capture. Uh, we started off, uh, we did a couple this month on um, building apps for 
uh, Android using Cordova CLI. And just in the, the near term for the next couple of months, we're going to try to keep talking about mobile and looking at the different things you can do with it. So if there's something you want to see done in mobile uh, later down the line, also send in those requests to guides at alphasoftware.com. And I don't remember the last slide. Yes, there we go. Send us your questions. But uh, so someone asked about list. Yeah, uh, how do you data source? Uh, list let's use, let's build developer issue 8099. Yeah, there's good builds and bad builds. 8,000 8, was a good build. <laughs> and I'm sure this one's fabulous. Oh, I'm sure this one's great too. Yeah. So this may take a moment to launch. I'm just going to make a new. Yeah, new workspace that. here. Uh, the name isn't really important, but one of the one of the changes, one of the new features uh, in this release. Um, oh, if I <laughs> if I have the right thing selected here, all files, new web component UX. Start with a blank one. If you have yeah. a list, and we'll just add in a list here. Using add control, I'll pick a list. I'm going to take the defaults. I could have gone through the, the genie. Yeah, the quick start. Um, there's a bit of a refresh thing that happens when I'm sharing my screen over uh, over the internet. So I there we go. Um, yeah. This seems to happen a lot with the go to, go to webinar. But I'll just quickly build a connection string. We'll create one called the Northwind connection string. I'm going to keep the copy I already have. I'll select that. Yeah, well, you know. We'll get our favorite table, customers. And we'll get we'll get all the fields here. Let's just get all of them. And down here, I think it's on this tab. It could be, be wrong. The advanced. You may need to expand the advanced. It might be in list properties. Ah, uh, here we go. Persist data to storage. So this enables the ability for all of your changes in the list to be stored locally on device. If it's a web app, your choices are traditionally just local storage. In mobile, we could also pick the file system. Uh, but one of the new options that you will now see in here is index DB. Notice it's index DB, not indexed DB. Um, if you're looking for this documentation in the release notes, that's uh, uh, just something to be aware of. Um, but all you have to do is pick that. And if it's available, it will be used. I believe if it's not available, it will fall back to Follow local that. storage. So keep that yeah, in mind. That. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but we, we, it tries its best. It's not going to fail outright. Uh, but if you are using it on a system that doesn't have index DB support, uh, be aware that you're not going to have access to that. And and for the systems that do support it, it, it seems like the default of, of space that you get that everyone seems to support as a minimum is a whole gigabyte. So is that insane? That's, that's a, crazy. That's a ton of space. And it can be as much as as much space as the as the browser is willing to let you take on the on the file system. Um, what's better, index DB or file system? It, well, on mobile, well, it it might might be pros and cons there on web you can't use the file system so that's <laughs> yeah. a, a huge huge reason to use index db but that's that's how um that's it you pick this you're ready to go um thank you sir yeah oh i gotta put a layout in here if i want to save it i always forget that there we go and save it and then that's it we're ready to go so that's that's the new new index db and, and yeah, dan will be a... going over that in depth later this Next yeah, we're going to be doing more work on that and uh, and showing more details on how to interact with it. There's uh, you can programmatically interact with it, which is kind of nice because you can almost use it like your own client side data cache, you know. Mm -hmm. So you can start centralizing certain things around it. Uh, so it's yeah. pretty handy from there. The only thing I'd say is, uh, and and I'll have to check uh, how do you populate the index DB other than outside of a list. But I'll work on um, getting the information. Those are some of the nuances I want to cover when we talk about that, so people kind of understand the box within what has been implemented so far so yeah definitely but yeah it's there it's new try it out um man everybody's going to start putting their images back in the database if they get a gig of space on <laughs> yeah instead of having an external now you can just parse those images right into the local store or into the index db and shove yeah. it back up onto the server 
So someone has asked um, Dion uh, recommendations for browsers to avoid, and I, I want to point this out. There's a website called Can I Use? I'm going to Google it. I don't want to type it in. Uh, can I Use? Can I Use dot com. And this is a giant, uh, well, not giant. It's a website that has like all the CSS HTML features out there. If you are targeting a browser and you don't know if the technology, the HTML CSS technology you want to use is supported, all you have to do is come here, search for the technology, find the article, and this lists all the browsers, who supports it, who doesn't support it, if the support is partial. Um, bookmark this. This is a, a valuable tool to have in your in your toolkit when you're building web and, and mobile. <laughs> who put this together and how come it's free? <laughs> That's a lot, that looks I, like a lot of work. <laughs> it is, a, I think it's community managed, so. Yeah, no, but I'm definitely sure it's a huge do, resource. Bookmark this, I'll put the, I'll put this right in the chat window for you guys. I mean, a big benefit is that like, for instance, um, and I don't know how much the adoption has been, but the new browser for Microsoft took over the Chrome engine, you know, so they're starting to, kind of say, hey, let's not fight over, let's just let people develop and go on there. There's no uniqueness on a browser, maybe the user experience around tabs and stuff, but the core part of it, they're trying to really create commonality, which I give them appreciation of. Developers don't like that stuff, so. Very cool, that's a neat site, I like it. And your big ones yeah. are obviously Chrome, Safari, and then Edge, really. I don't know how far Edge has taken over IE. I, there's still a lot of IE uh, stuff out there because of mainly security I think it's issues. surpassed it at this point. It has? Okay, yeah. 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 They I don't, think what they're doing they is they're not updating anymore. the security elements of IE, so that's driving the companies to say, well, can't can't do IE anymore. That was always a pain. Yeah. Um, someone has asked Diana, how, how would you drop in a third-party template into a view box and then link in the fields ah, from the list? Great. Me, you want me to turn I that mean, back over to you? Yeah, if you don't mind. Yeah, that'd be great. Make you the presenter again. Let's switch back and forth here. Okay, cool. So, you know, there's a ton of uh, CSS templates out there. Now, realize some are, you got to be a little careful. If some say like Bootstrap, you have to make sure to put into your application to load the Bootstrap library. I, and I, you probably know more of this. Um, we, we don't by nature load the bootstrap in your app, if I'm not mistaken. Let me go to my project settings. But you know, you can easily add bootstrap in because you can pull it off a CDN kind of scenario. That's not it. Wait a second here. Let's go to project properties. Okay. Yeah. So all I say is that when you're looking at templates, you know, if it's depending on bootstrap, then uh, you will need to uh, add in like a Bootstrap. Let me just show you an example of it here. Okay, so Bootstrap is a framework, so think of it as a whole bunch of stuff that then people write CSS and HTML on top. The super important thing is that if you want to have Bootstrap in it, you're going to have to link a reference to the libraries in your system. And if you're using some of their JavaScript elements, you got to link that in there. And this walks you through that from that standpoint. Uh, but that's, again, only if you're using Bootstrap. If you're just using plain vanilla CSS, you can go from, let's say, let's say uh, CSS templates. These may be things here. Let's see. I think that might be, nah. So there's more. There's some templates that are full thing. Uh, so let me try an example. There are usually like full uh, website templates you'll see out there. But you know, definitely look at the Bootstrap world because there's some really nice stuff that's been built on top of Bootstrap, which are nice there. I'm trying to find just a piece of HTML and CSS. Let me try. Uh, let, me, let me do it this way. Let me right here. Let's go. CSS widget template. Bear with it's running a little slow. Let me get rid of some of this other stuff here. Okay. Let's look at that. Oh, this is something a little more geeky there. Uh, the way I usually work it, just to let you know, is that I will, um, let's see. Let's see, I'm just trying to find a good example. I usually put together a wireframe 
And then I hand that off to my CSS HTML designer. And they basically are going to give me back a couple things. So let me go in here and into here. They're going to give me mainly two things. One is they're going to give me a set of HTML. So they'll give me like the HTML and then they'll give me some CSS. Now I have two options. I can just paste the CSS right here or I can, um, let me go back here. Let's go to the data source. I'm just going to make this um, not database HTML so it doesn't keep giving me the answer. Okay. So again, layout will just be, you know, uh, some same HTML. Now the CSS, I can do one of two things. I can paste the CSS here, which is perfectly fine. But if I'm going to reuse that CSS, I can actually create a CSS file and associate it with the UX so it's already there and you'll be able to find it. But for simplicity's sake, I usually just paste it in here to make sure everything's working on there. So uh, this is all weather stuff. I'm not sure what's going on here. Let me see if I can find one that's kind of cool. Okay, so let's look at this here. So you'll feel something like this and you'll see there's HTML and here's the HTML. You would copy this information and then you would copy the CSS. And this is the CSS that goes with it. J JavaScript, you may not need. I mean, this is JavaScript because this is a dynamic app. Let's, hey, for giggles, I'm just gonna try this. So let's go ahead and copy this. I just wanna see if it'll render that. So I'm gonna copy that. I'm gonna go into here. I'm gonna to go to my layout because that's where the CSS goes and I'm gonna paste it there. Okay, so you'll notice I pasted in my CSS here. I'm sorry, my HTML. So I'm gonna go back here, I'm gonna to go to the CSS, and I'm gonna go ahead and grab that CSS, and it will be very similar to this when your designer gives it to you. Copy it, Oops, I mean, I think it copied something more. Go here. I go into the CSS, I paste it there. And then, uh, I don't know if preview will work here, but let's take a look at it. Sort of worked, it kind of has the background color, but I think it relies on the JavaScript there. Uh, so this will show the information here. Now what's kind of cool too, is that once I have this, once I've selected my data source, let me go ahead and make a data source selection. Go ahead and go to, and I'll just say a database query for now. And we'll go to fields here, hit customers. There we go there. Now, once I have connected to my data in my view box layout, I can go to a position in my layout, let's say at this location right here. Um, let me see if there's something more interesting here. Like instead of this, I want to actually put in a data element. I can then insert a field and insert one of those fields. And you'll notice it has the curly brackets. So the cool thing about that is once I have my HTML and CSS, I can now tie it to my data source. So Alpha will take care of presenting that to the user in there. So let's just, just for giggles, I know preview is kind of a little problematic. Let me just see what this looks like when I actually do a working preview. I don't think it's going to look anything because I think it depends on that JavaScript to actually present the data in the uh, in there. But who knows? We'll see what happens there. Oh, yeah, I guess some of it's in there. Doesn't look super well. I'm sure I'd have to do some toying. And it's mainly because it's missing that uh, there. But what's great about this, oh, you know why it has multiple rows here is because I tied it to that database. So each one for each customer. But you'll notice that already I have kind of the color and the fonts and the styling that is supposed to be presented. That is all driven by the layout and the CSS. Now, this is uh, probably more complex than you'll see. My stuff is usually pretty simple because I'm not doing any really super amazing kind of stuff. But a really talented designer can put together a little, and I just give them a wireframe saying this how, and then it can be really beautiful. Now, again, and I know, how much time do I have? Just a second. Um, do explore Bootstrap because there's a lot of pre-made Bootstrap stuff out there. They also have a whole bunch of set of controls that are available that are really nice. But either way, you can really make your system look a lot nicer because you can use a talented CSS uh, HTML designer to help you make it look sharp. And that's where it's just uh, easy to do, especially with a view box where all I have to do is paste in 
the layout and the CSS. The system then does the merge with the data if I've inserted my fields. And there's a lot of other sophisticated things you can do in terms of looping data and other things like that. So I hope that gives you a bit of a feel for how you would do that. Um, I, I know that was kind of rough because I didn't have a pre-made example, but that's the basic process. Get the HTML, get the CSS, put it into your view box, and then connect it to your data in terms of inserting the fields into the layout section. All right. Well, thank you. Um, thank you. We have definitely run out of time. Uh, thank you, everybody, <laughs> for joining us uh, this week, uh, the last week of March. Uh, we are entering uh, the Ides Q's of March next, next month. <laughs> Yeah. So yeah, thank you, Dion, for presenting today. I look forward to seeing everyone next week uh, when we have our presentation, our new feature review on the new features in Alpha Anywhere. Check it out. Uh, and uh, I hope you have a wonderful week. Thanks for joining us. We'll catch you next time. Bye-bye.